Welcome to worship for the Aurora, Bradshaw, and Phillips United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Michelle, and Pastor Greg and I are here to offer you online worship that we might share the love of God and Jesus Christ to you wherever you are this weekend. This is the first Sunday in July, which um, is July 4th, so happy Independence Day. I pray that your celebrations are safe and meaningful. It's also the Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, that uh, we in the United Methodist Church share communion with our congregations. And so I wanted to remind you that if you are at home and would like to receive communion, please contact us. We would be able to bring that to you either through one of our communion groups or Pastor Greg and I can get that over to you sometime. We would be happy to serve you in that way. Let's begin worshiping together with an opening hymn we've chosen. This is My Father's World. Sing with us. is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world i rest me in the thought of rocks and trees of sky As we come to a time that we can pray together and share our joys and sorrows, I would invite you to lift up Pastor Greg and our family in prayer on the passing of Greg's father, Lloyd Reed. Um, he lived in Omaha and we will be celebrating his life with family and friends soon and we just ask for your prayers for our family during this time of our loss and our grief. We thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Let's take a few moments to pray together. I'll begin with a moment of silence and then invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and every day, for the blessings which we have received from your hands, for the glory of this creation and all that you have created, and for our place in this world and our place with you. God, we are happy that we are able to be in this relationship with you, to be in covenant with you, that you have promised us that you will be our God and we promise to be your people. And so we thank you for this relationship and ask for your forgiveness, for your grace, for your mercy. At those times when we pay less attention to you and more attention to ourselves or to the things of this world. God, you have created us to be in relationship with one another. And when we find ourselves alone or relying only on ourselves, 
We ask that you would draw us back closer to you and to our community of faith that helps us deal with our lives from day to day. God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful for his ministry because it gives us hope when we know that he reached out to those who were lost, those who had been forsaken, those who were sick or ill or in need of special care. We think of ourselves sometimes in that place as persons in need of care. And we know that we have a friend in Jesus, that he walks with us, stands by us, and carries us as we need him to. God, we are grateful that he gave his life so that we might have eternal life and that we gather with believers near and far to share in this joy, in this communion of saints, in this great body of Christ the church, as we share our faith and walk with you all our days. We ask you to lift up those who are suffering this day. Hear our prayers for those who are hungry or thirsty. And we ask that you celebrate with those of us who are celebrating, whether we are remembering lives of loved ones or sharing in joy of new gifts of life. We know that you are with us and we are grateful for your eternal presence and salvation. So we offer ourselves to you this day, God. We commit our lives to you once again, each and every day, as well as those whom we love, because we trust in your everlasting arms. We pray all of this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is a very short chorus, but it is a gift of peace to you and to those you are worshiping with today. It's Shalom to you now. Won't you join us as we sing? Since this Sunday is Independence Day, we're going to talk about Ben Franklin and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and John Hancock and the Declaration of Independence. Not because those are necessarily good church things, but because I was thinking about those stuff because it's Independence Day and because there's, there's something there in using that part of our history that I think works well with the passage that I want to, to share with you today. So our, our passage the, for this service is found in the uh, second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. It's in the 12th chapter beginning with the second verse. I invite you to listen for the word of God. I know a man in Christ who was caught up into the third heaven 14 years ago. I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. God knows. 
I know that this man was caught up into paradise and that he heard unspeakable words that were things no one is allowed to repeat. I don't know whether it was in the body or apart from the body. God knows. I'll brag about this man, but I won't brag about myself except to brag about my weakness. If I did want to brag, I wouldn't make a fool of myself because I'd tell the truth. I'm holding back from bragging so that no one will give me any more credit than anyone sees or hears about me. I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I've received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weakness so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'll write my weaknesses, insults, disasters and harassments and stressful situations for the sake of Christ because I'm weak, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Here ends the reading. So this is a passage that has a lot of intriguing, mysterious sounding images. He, he talks about the man who was caught up into the third heaven, whatever the third heaven and the first heaven and the second heaven and, and how all of that works is is never explained anywhere. He, we don't know who this, this man is, but we, we'll, we'll come back to that. He talks about having heard unspeakable words, and we have no idea what those unspeakable words, obviously because, well, they were unspeakable, and he was not allowed to repeat them. He also talks about a thorn that was given to him by Satan, and and there's been much speculation on exactly what that thorn is, whether it was a, a physical ailment, whether it was, was some other sort of thing or some temptation that he tended to, to fall into. And, and really there's, once again, nothing there that, can, that we can do with other than to speculate. Of course, oftentimes... When the Bible offers us mysteries that seem unsolvable, that, that we can't tease out somewhere else, perhaps we should accept the idea that because we're not supposed to, because that's not what the passage is about. And in many ways, these mysteries are important, but they're important because they're mysteries, and they're important exactly because that's not what the passage is about. The one very specific thing that he speaks of in terms of his relationship with God is what God spoke to him as he asked God to remove this thorn that had been placed upon him. And God speaks to him and says, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I want to put that out there, even though it's at the end of the passage, right at the beginning, because everything that, that I say from this point on is under that heading that says, first, my grace is enough for you. This is the, the, the statement of the gospel, that God's grace is enough for us. It is enough for us in living this life. It is enough for us for our salvation. It is enough for us to, to be lifted up into heaven and to, to live the eternal life that God has promised. God's grace is enough. Nothing else is needed. And then the second statement is a, is a non-mysterious unveiled reference to how this is accomplished. God's power is accomplished in weakness in this world. It is the weakness of going to the cross, to allowing the powers of this world to face Christ on the cross, is the weakness in this world, and that's where the true power of God's grace was revealed. And in our weakness, and, and this is the, the theme that, that we'll land on at the end here, 
it is in our weakness that we find power because it's in our weakness that we understand that God's grace is enough for us. So the one piece that is mysterious in the writing, but there seems to be a strong consensus on biblical readers over the generation that even though Paul talks about uh, a man um, in Christ who is caught up in the third heaven, talks about this man in the, in the third person, that what Paul is really describing is an experience that he has had. Now, he's describing this experience, and he's speaking out of the context of an argument that he's, that he's having with other people who are professing the gospel in the city of Corinth and are calling him foolish and are claiming that they have greater knowledge, greater understanding, that they have had these, these great experiences. He calls them in the, in the scripture super apostles because they've had all of these mighty experiences of God, all of these revelations in their life. And so they're, they're, they're speaking those things and, and they're speaking out of this, this power and authority given to them by these, these experiences, these, 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 revelations of God that they've had. And what Paul is saying is that none of that gives you any more authority than anyone else who is simply speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is essentially speaking the thing that God spoke to Paul, which is God's grace is enough for us that our power is made perfect in weakness. And so it doesn't matter what kind of credentials you have, what kind of spiritual credentials, what kind of miraculous experience that you've had, but the truth is found simply by speaking the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is where I wanted to, to get to all of those people, you know, the Benjamin Franklins and the Thomas Jeffersons and the John Adams and the John Hancocks and the, and the Declaration of Independence. Because on this July 4th, I was thinking about them as, as sort of the super apostles. You know, all of those those historical figures, not only those at, at the time of the founding, but, but all of those through history. George Washington as the general through the Revolutionary War and the first president and the Abraham Lincolns and, the, and, 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 and all of those who, who wrote the Constitution and all of those who have, have done these things that have filled our history books, who are, are called the, the great Americans. Now, it isn't John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin who are what create or who are the soul of this country. The soul of the country is, is in the document that they created. The gospel that they are, are speaking, the, the, the good news that they are speaking is the good news that's written in the, the line that, that Jefferson puts forward and they all agree to, which is everyone is created equal. So anyone who is speaking toward that truth that was at the foundation of the nation, these people are not the foundation of the nation. The heroes, the great Americans, are not the foundation of the country. The foundation of the country is that basic understanding that everyone is created equal with certain inalienable rights 
the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with an understanding that it is the, the governed who should decide how the, the government will exist, what, what developed into the democracy that, that became uh, written into our Constitution. So it doesn't matter how great, how historically great your activities are, you speak to the soul of America not because of your great deeds, but you speak when you perfect that basic understanding that everyone is created equal with certain inalienable rights, that we value each and every person in a way that wasn't a part of most governments in the world at that time. So we don't have to go back to the history books. We just have to listen for that basic truth. It is the truth that, that isn't so very much different than, than God's statement that my grace is enough for you because God has offered that grace to all that whatever other burdens that, that we might have that, that have been laid upon us or that we have laid upon ourselves by our, by our own insufficiency, God's grace is enough for us. Enough for us to understand that we can love everyone else and that we can understand what is the heart of what the founders were trying to get at, that everyone is created equal. So I draw these two parallels along these two things in that we can speak as faithfully and as powerfully the, the, the truth about this nation when we perfect the understanding that all people are created equal. And we can speak with as much power as Paul or anyone who has, has done great miracles or had, had visions or revelations of God. If we speak the truth that God's grace in Jesus Christ is enough for us and that we are made powerful in weakness. So that's the starting point. But... If we're talking about the Declaration of Independence, and I've avoided using the exact words that are in the, the Declaration of Independence, which say all men are created equal. Now, I'm sure as they, as they wrote it down, they, they intended it as a generic term for all people. But the reality of the time and the reality for much of this history is the truth was it was its more exact meaning that was the real truth, that all men were equal. Not that we've lived that out, but that was its, its best understanding. And even more exactly, the way they lived their life at the time and the ways the society was structured for, for decades afterward, and we still struggle with, is that the statement could have easily have been written, all white men are created equal. And even more so in, in the time of, of, of when they first started voting, all white men who owned land are created equal. There was a brokenness that was a part of it. I don't think the brokenness was intended. I think the, the intent when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, when they put those words out, was truly to say all people are created equal with certain inalienable rights. But they had something, something that, that was to obstruct that, a thorn. Paul said that thorn was given to me by Satan. There was a thorn that was a part of the lives of those people and, and, and us today that obstructs us from living out that reality, just as the thorn made Paul's life in faith 
a trial and was intended to trip him up was intended to tear him down. And he asked God to take that from him. But God said, my grace is sufficient. And you are made powerful in weakness. So this thorn that has always been a part of our nation, this thorn that was a part of Paul's life, that, that kept him from becoming this conceited super apostle that others had to, to brag constantly about the, the things he did. Yes, it sounds like he brags about it in here, but I think his intent in, in mentioning those things is saying, I'm not saying this because I haven't had all these experiences. I've had as much experience as any of them, but none of those things matter. What matters is God's grace and the good news of Jesus Christ. But this thorn that, that God left in Paul, and it's important to understand that Paul doesn't see this as something that God gave him to test him or that God gave him in order for him to, 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 to be humbled. It was given by the enemy. And the brokenness in our country is not a gift from God so that we can grow. But just as that thorn helped Paul to understand his weakness, if we can look at our insufficiencies, look at the ways that we have not lived out that root statement that all of us are created equal with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That God's grace is sufficient for us. That we are made powerful in our weakness. We can take those thorns and, and perfect our understanding of what equality is. We can perfect our understanding of what God's grace is. We can perfect our understanding of what true power is. by knowing that we have thorns in us, given to us by the enemy, given to us by those who would try to tear down those things that we value, the things that we value as a nation, the things that we value as disciples of Jesus Christ, as lovers of God. But in all things, in that weakness, in knowing that there are thorns, that there are faults, that there are brokenness, to be able to understand those are part of our life, to not have them swept aside in some way that frees us from any, any understanding, any, any acceptance that that is a part of our life, but instead knowing that there is grace, that there is growth, that as we understand those things, we can be perfected. That we can have a better understanding because of the trials that we have faced. So God's grace is enough. We will find our power in our weakness because in our weakness, we understand that it is not our resume, it is not our greatness, it is not our experience that matters. It is the good news of the grace of God that we are given power by the, the weakness, the humility that Christ showed on the cross.